week we're always finding so strongly something in the parsha. I know we did in this class Precious and we did Nayak and we did Lechlecha and we did Vagira and we did Chayasara and each week we showed the Torah what we're going through in Precious and in Nayak and in Lechlecha and Vagira and Chayasara. Now last week was Toldos and I thought it was unbelievable, unbelievable. And of course, being me, I shared it with a number of people. Everyone, it was like, oh my. How last week, on the 40th day of the war, they found a hostage, dead Yehudis from, from the kibbutz of the Iri. And if you look in last week's portion, Parsha Toldos, chapter 26, verse 34. When Asa was 40 years old, as this woman was found on the 40th day, he took as a wife Yehudis, as this woman's name was Yehudis, daughter of Be'eri, Yehudis from Be'eri, Yehudis from Be'eri was found on the 40th day. And if that's not enough, you look at Rashi. And Rashi says, why did Asa do this when he was 40 years old? Because for 40 years, he was abducting women. He was abducting and abusing women. What is the word Rashi uses for Asa's abduction and abuse of women? Chumsim, Hamas. So 40 years on the 40th day, Yehudis, Yehudis, Be'eri, Be'eri. And the word for the abduction and abuse of women? Hamas. It was like, whoa. Again, it wasn't a, we're so happy. No, it was a horrible thing. It wasn't a positive thing. It was a horrible thing. But it was to me, this was my framing this. Everything is in Tyra. Everything is from Tyra. Tyra creates reality. And we want to look at that Tyra as we did in Barashas and Noach and Lecha and Meir and Chaisara and see the reality of our control of the land, the reality of our dominion, the reality of our vanquishing Hamas. And in Toldos, we got the reality of what Hamas literally, to the detail, is doing. So with that set of eyes, I looked at this week's Parsha. And I was like, you know, what do I see in this Parsha that relates to the situation? You may not think it relates, but to me, it was very strongly saying how we're supposed to interact with the nations around us. And I think that's a very pivotal thing going on now is as they're looking at us and as anti-Semitism is so high and acceptably out there, and at the same time as there's so much proud support for the Jewish people and for Israel, we got both extreme measures, amazing the support, amazing the comfort in gas the Jews anti-Semitism. So how are we supposed to relate to the world around us? What's our role in this? So in this week's Torah portion, which is by say, you look in, this is Monday's portion, the Torah portion is divided seven sections, the seven days of the week. So the second portion, Monday, it begins, and Yaakov, Jacob, lifted his legs, lifted his feet, and went to the land in the east. Now just to put a little Torah framework, like what are we talking about? Like give you the backstory so you understand the context. So the life and times of Yaakov, of Jacob. He is a child of Yitzchak and Rivka, Isaac and Rebekah. Yitzchak, Isaac, the son of Abram and Sarah, Abram and Sarah. Rivka, Rebekah, the daughter of Esuel, an incredibly wicked person and related to Abraham and the sister of Lavan, an even more incredibly wicked person, or perhaps they were both as wicked. Yitzhak and Rivka are married for 20 years, and God blesses them with children with twin boys. Yaakov, Jacob, perfectly righteous. Esav, incredibly evil. For the first 63 years of Yaakov's life, he's studying Torah. <laughs> he, he's, for the first 15 years of his life, the first 15 years of his life, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Aram, Isaac, and Jacob were all on planet Earth together. According to Rashi for the first 13, according to others for the first 15. And we're told from the Midrash, that for every day of those 15 years, the three of them learned Torah. I don't know what that meant for baby Yaakov, but I trust that it means exactly what we're understanding because he wasn't a baby, he was Yaakov. And he continued this way for the first 63 years of his life. After 63 years, when his father Yitzhak Isaac is thinking, I might die now because it's my birthday tonight. And I don't know, you're supposed to think five years before and five years after the passing of either one of your parents. So now within five years of my mother's passing, I might die really soon. I want to make sure before I die to bless my children. A lot of people misunderstand this whole blessing, which was, of course, last week's Torah portion. I'm not going to speak at length, but just to, to give you a little bit of an understanding. Whatever Isaac Yitzhak's understanding of Esau was, it wasn't that he was going to be the father of the Jewish people. That he had no question on. The father, the lineage of the Jewish people was Yaakov. And as we see at the end of the Torah portion, before Yaakov leaves, he blesses him with the Jewish people and the Jewish land. 
what we call the inheritance of Abraham, of Abraham. You are the father of the Jewish people. You will receive the lands of the Jews of Israel. That was never on the table. And therefore, that's not actually the subject of the blessings that he meant to give Asaph and that Yaakov stole. So why, if he knows that Yaakov is the father of the Jewish people, is he wanting to bless Asaph? Well, if you wanted 10 reasons, then I could give you 10. If you wanted 20, I could give you 20. Definitely, according to all the commentators, on some level, Yitzhak understood Asaph's wickedness, some to a greater degree, some to a lesser degree, but definitely understood he was no Yaakov. That is for sure clear. So then why does he want to bless him? Some say he thought through the blessings this would inspire him to return to God. Some say he knew that Asaph could never be a Jew, but he hoped he could facilitate the Jewish people. Sort of like the relationship that later did happen between Yisachar and Zvulun, where Yisachar sits and learns and Zvulun supports them. He was thinking the children of Yaakov, the Jewish people, are just in the door all day. And Asa, not like all the other nations, but not a Jewish nation, they'll support them. So I'm giving him blessing to have financial success, agricultural success, political success, which was the content of the blessings, so he can support this other nation he's related to that he can learn Torah all day. And Asa won't just be like a regular non-Jew. Another sort of similar but different version, comparing it to the relationship of Levi and the Jewish people. Just as the tribe of Levi were holier, were dedicating to serving God, and the rest of the Jews basically supported them. So too, Yitzhak's vision, Yaakov, his descendants are going to be super holy. They will know how to handle planet Earth. Asa's going to take care of them. So let's give him the blessing so he can take care of two nations, his own and Yaakov's, and many, many, many other explanations. Rivka, Rebecca, understood no way women always have this extra measure of understanding. Just as Sarah truly saw Ishmael's wickedness, Ishmael's wickedness, Rivka, Rebecca, truly understood the depth of evil of her son Asa. And she's like, no way. Any power we give Asa will only be used to harm us. The more Asa has power, the more it will hurt the Jewish people. No, the opposite. We, Yaakov, the Jewish people, we need to get those blessings and not only have what's naturally ours, godliness, spirituality, the Jewish people, the land of Israel. We need all those powers as well. Financial power, agricultural power, political power. We need Asaph's powers to truly serve God on both levels. And that was the setup. And Yaakov took the blessings under his mother's direction. And Asaph was furious. Now, when I'm furious or when you're furious, you might crumble a piece of paper. Asaph's version of furious was he's going to murder him. Rebecca, Rivka, knowing this, said, Yaakov better get out of here. She can't just tell the straight to her husband. She said, you know what? I have such pain, stress, annoyance, displeasure, aggravation from Esau's wives. No way can Yaakov marry a woman from this native land. He has to go back to my family, just as your father took a wife from his family, me. He has to go back to my family, go to Lavan, my brother, get one of his daughters, marry into the family, and then we'll be able to have Jewish pride, nachas from Yaakov and his new wife. This looks like a great idea because that's what his father did, make perfect sense, not knowing that Rivka did this to get him out of the way. Okay, he leaves. How long does he leave for? He really left for 36 years. But we're not 36 years into the story. I'm saying this back to if you understand what we're holding. He actually was supposed to go straight to his uncle in Haran, Lovan, but he took a detour and spent 14 years learning Torah day and night in the Shiva, the rabbinical school, so to speak, of Shem and Aver. And then he went on to his uncle, where he spent 20 years. And then he spent another year and a half traveling back home. And then he came back to his father 36 years later. So now he is, he was 63 when he got the blessings. Now he's 77. And now we're up to this verse. This is all just so we should have context as we learn these verses and see what's Torah trying to tell us. So in chapter 29, the first verse, and Yaakov and Jacob lifted his feet and went to the land of Kedem. Where is he going? He's going to a really wicked place, to really wicked people, to his uncle Lavan, who's like an arch villain, like neon colors evil. And he lifts up his feet to go. And we're like, wait a minute, here's Yaakov, who's been sequestered his entire life, has some nasty interactions with his brother. But besides that, he's lived a life of purity and holiness and Torah and prayer and more Torah and more prayer and service of God. In such intense degree, we can't even imagine. And now he's so excited to go and encounter leaving Israel. 
Haran, when he went to his outside of Israel? His uncle, the people of the land, what's going on? What did he lift up his feet for? So we're told he was really happy because he knew he was going on his shlichus. He was going on his mission. This is what his life was supposed to be about. So this is, I think, the first lesson we take from this. There's a saying our sages have, ma'ase avos siman labanim. The actions of the forefathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, that's a sign for us. So this first sign is when we look at our life, we could also, you know, sometimes feel we're getting a raw deal. We could also sometimes have things that are difficult. And Vayisa Yaakov is Raglo. Asa Yaakov, sorry, lifts up his feet. He's going with joy because he's like, this is my shlichus. This is my mission. This is what God wants from me. This is what my, as we would say, Rebbe, my father, who's my guide, who's my spiritual mentor, is telling me, this is your mission. Go. So I think that's the first thing as we encounter the world, as Yaakov is now encountering the world, and as we are dealing with the world, we lift up our feet, which, ex which the expression means, I mean, what do you mean? Yeah, every time you walk, you lift up your feet. It means you're going with energy. You're going with joy because you know this is your mission. You know this is what God wants from you. So as we're encountering whatever we're encountering, personally or as we look in the world, as we said, the enormous overt expressions of anti-Semitism and the very overt expressions of pride and support for the Jewish people and the Jewish land, we lift up our feet. We go with pride. We go with joy. We go with energy. As Yaakov did, he wasn't going to a fun place. He knew he wasn't going to a fun place. He knew it was going to be challenging, but this is his mission. This is what God wants from him. Fine. So he's going. And now the narrator, so to speak, of the Torah, which is, of course, God himself, says, and he sees. He gets to Haran. Haran is north of Israel. And he sees a well in the field. And there's three flocks of sheep crouching. Because from this well, the flocks were water. And there was a tremendous rock on the well. Now, this is what Yaakov Jacob saw. And he's looking and he's really confused. Why is he really confused? Well, he's grown up, he's grown up all his life among shepherds. Not that he personally was a shepherd, but he knows, you know, the lay of the land. And he knows this makes no sense. What does a shepherd do? He takes out the flock in the morning and he brings them back toward dusk. When it's getting dark, not when it's totally dark, because obviously then they would trip. But as the sun's setting, that's when the shepherd brings back the flock. And what do the sheep do all day? They graze. They eat. They get fatter, more productive. Do they ever come to a well? Yeah, they come. They get water. They keep going. And they graze. And they graze. And they graze. Say a very boring job or lots of time to, you know, do other things. <laughs> because they're just grazing all day. But now here it is. It's like high noon, so to speak. It's the middle of the day. And the flocks are just like waiting. He's like, this makes no sense. And he's trying to process this. Now, again, this isn't his main occupation. He's here to find Lovan, to find his wife. But what's going on? And the only thing that makes any sense to him, which doesn't make sense, but the only thing he's thinking is they must be bringing the flocks home. But that doesn't really make sense because it's the middle of the day. Now, the Torah, the narrator, God's voice tells us the scoop. But Yaakov didn't know it. We know it. So the next verse says, all the flocks would gather and then they would roll the stone from on the well and they would give water to all the sheep and then they would put back the stone from on the well to its place. Meaning what the Torah is telling us is Lavan was the arch villain, the master of deception and cruelty, mega evil, mega cheap, mega deceitful. The people of his place went along the same lines. Maybe they weren't as extreme as him, but they were definitely all in that direction. He might have just been the master of it all. Which means Haran was an unusually evil place. Kabbalistically, we're actually told it's called Haran from the word Haron, which means anger. Because until Yaakov got there, until Jacob got there, this was the place of God's anger. These people were so wicked, this was the place of God's anger. With all the work Yaakov did there in 20 years, he refined and turned around the energy of the place. But when he gets there, it's a real nasty place. And what shows us this? Exactly this point. Here we have, they're not in the desert. I mean, the flocks are grazing on grass. So there's obviously water supply. But the people of Hura, 
were so cheap and were so deceitful that they didn't trust each other. The more deceitful you are, the more you assume the person you're dealing with is also deceitful as we actually see. We're not going to continue learning it. But as we see in the Torah portion, how Lavan is treating Yaakov, assuming that Yaakov is so deceitful because Lavan is so deceitful. You look at the world as your mirror. So because the people were so cheap as Lavan was incredibly and so deceitful as Lavan was incredibly, they were like, no, 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 no. We can't be like these stupid, naive people all over the world that just have a, a well and anyone that wants can come and water their sheep. No, no, we're much smarter than that. We're going to have an enormous rock over the well. Such a huge rock that it will take the strength of every shepherd combined to lift up that rock. So therefore, all of us have to be there. And we're all going to watch and see what everyone else is doing and how much water everyone's taking. And then we all put the rock back on. So nobody gets a drop of water that we don't know about because we don't trust anyone. And even though there was obviously plenty of water, because there was plenty of grass, but we're mega cheap. No, 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 we're watching. Now, Jacob doesn't know this, but we do. So we're getting an inkling into the place. Jacob already knew about the place because he knew about his uncle. We're getting an inkling into the place and we're understanding what's going on. I'll take a little more quickly because I did want to also talk directly about what's going on in Israel, but I did want you to understand this point here in the Torah that I thought was so powerful. So now Jacob starts speaking to these people. Now, they're shepherds. Shepherds are not high on the totem pole, even in those days. They were like lower on the totem pole, more common, more simple, lower class, less prosperity or affluence, whatever was called affluence in those days. And Yaakov clearly doesn't know them. And Yaakov clearly has no business with them. He's going to his uncle to find a way. And yet when he talks to them, if you listen to the word he says, and again, everything in Torah is very measured. We didn't have like one word on the first 63 years of Yaakov's life. We don't have like one word on the 14 years he spent learning Torah. Any words we're told, we're told for a reason. So Yaakov says to them, Achai, my brothers, from where are you? They say they're from Haran. He says, do you know Lavan? He says, we know him. He says, there's a people with him. He says, yeah, look, his daughter's coming right now to Shepherd. He starts off by saying, my brothers. That's a very powerful word. He doesn't know them. He's not related. He's not on their social level. He's got nothing to do with them. But that's not how he looks at them. He looks at them with warmth, with respect, with a sense of kinship, my brothers. And this is the first thing we see of how Yaakov interacts with the world around him. It's a very powerful message that Torah is telling us that when we look at the world around us, we're supposed to look with that paradigm. We're supposed to try as much as possible to have that my brother's perspective, to have that warmth, to have that respect, to have that commonality of mankind as we interact. But we're not done. There was more I was going to say, but I see the time. So maybe I'm going to make it a little briefer. But he says, oh, it was Rachel. What Rachel? Okay, whatever. There's a lot of details on why it was Rachel and nobody else, but we're going to skip that. And then he says to them, there's a lot of sunlight. Got plenty of time to to shepherd. Give water to the sheep and go shepherd. What's going on here? Why is this significant? This is to this concept of these shepherds and this well and this rock, the Torah spends four verses, two before and two now, because then the shepherds say, well, you know, the well, the rock, we all have to come and we have to roll it off. It's so heavy. Four verses on something completely extraneous for a whole story. No, it's not extraneous. The Torah is teaching us something very powerful. What is Yaakov doing here? Yaakov is not at all connected to these shepherds. They've got nothing to do with his life. He got his information. Lavan is at peace. The woman approaching is Rachel. Done. Move on. No. Why? Because Yaakov is the prototype Jew. Yaakov is a representative God in this world. And therefore, when Yaakov sees what seems to him as iniquity, what sees to him as something wrong going on, he can't just move on because it's none of his business. It's got nothing to do with him. And who, who does he care anyway? This is none of my business. Doesn't impact me at all. Why do I care? Because I'm a Jew. And as a Jew, I have a responsibility to affect the morality of the world. And therefore, Yaakov said to them, wait a minute, this is wrong. We've got two options. I don't know you at all, so I don't know the backstory. But we've got two options. Either you're hired shepherds or these sheep are actually your own. If you're hired shepherds, which is probably the more normative option, you're cheating masters. You're being paid for a day's work and you're coming back midday. You're not allowed to do that. 
What if they say, no, 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 these are actually our own sheep. We're not cheating anyone. You're cheating the sheep. There's something called sa'ar bale chayim, that we're not allowed to inflict an animal with pain. If the sheep have the ability to graze all day and you only have them graze half a day, you're cheating the sheep. You're inflicting pain on them. We don't do that either. Get up, water the sheep, and go back and let them graze. And then they explain to him, well, no, actually, this is such a cheapo place that we're all, um, he, they told him the whole story. I thought this was a very powerful point. And again, in this week's talk portion, I really was thinking about it as like, this is, this is very timely for us. We're being told a message about how we are supposed to interact with the world. And again, the Torah spent four verses on this. The Torah is so careful with its words. We're spending four verses on this totally, as we would call it, side story. It's not a side story. It's giving us a direction in how a Jew interacts with the world. So on one hand, we have Isa Yaakov is Ravla. Yaakov lifts his feet. No matter what we encounter, we have joy and we have positivity. We understand we are God's messengers and whatever we're doing is part of our mission. And therefore, we approach it with joy and confidence. The second thing we saw was Achai, my brothers. We look at the world and we look at the world not as like, oh, well, we don't care about these people anyway, whatever. They're all whatever, irrelevant to us. You know, we're the Jewish people and they're not, nobody's nothing. No, we look at the world, achai, my brothers. We look at the world that there is brotherhood, that there is kinship, that there is relationship and that we are here for the people of the world as well. And then most significantly, as we see with Yaakov, we look at the world as we are supposed to interface with this world. And it's very possible as we interface, we're going to see uh, less morality than we should. And we have a responsibility to extend kindness and try to raise up the people around us. Anyone can think of a situation where they saw this in their life or where they see this in their life, where they really do see that responsibility for the world or see how they interact with the world or see how they say things that can give people a different message of morality and values um is my brother-in-law the er doctor going to do what he did does that apply to that it, if do, do the people like in his hospital know and he's giving them that message absolutely yes 100 percent. he felt a very very strong bond and connection with them absolutely that's a very beautiful example it's showing them like we say when people say, do you have any relatives in Israel? And you say, yeah, about 8 million. Absolutely. The selflessness and the bonds and putting your own selflessness, putting yourself on the side because you're needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I think what Miriam is also pointing out here is sometimes our example, if they know our example, is the loudest message. And you're absolutely right. You know, whatever we do, the world's always going to know it as Jew. And we're obviously seeing this very loudly now, as we're saying in both directions, but it's always been true. Whatever we do, people are going to process, oh, this is how Jews do whatever they do. And, you know, it's, 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 you know, Eliza was talking about the person looking for her horns. And I remember sharing with you the story of how that nurse was so beyond kind driving me back from the emergency room because a Jew had been kind to him. So a Jew had been kind to him. So years later, he sees me, a Jew, obviously, and just naturally feels he owes me one. He owes a Jew one. So a Jew, a Jew, that Jew, this Jew, Jews. So yes, very often, like Miriam's saying, even if we're not overtly teaching them and raising their moral standards and directly telling them ways to behave better, but our example is very, very, very loud message. And when they know it's us, they know it's a Jew. And they always remember it as a Jew. Absolutely. Anyone else? Aliza? I don't hear you. You're still muted. Sorry. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The example that people have been talking about since the rally in Washington, D.C., that's been such a public demonstration of what a Jew is, is the Hakar Satov that was demonstrated to all of the security people, all of these non-Jewish policemen who like were given cookies from the Silver Spring community, I think, and were given more thank yous in one day than they had in their entire career. And I, I think I shared with you that the Secret Service mm -hmm. You did. You shared it last week. And I, yeah. the truth is, I was actually thinking about that when I was 
thinking about this concept, I was actually remembering exactly what you said, Aliza, that again, no, nobody went over to them directly. Perhaps people did, probably they didn't to directly instruct them. But definitely, I'm sure everyone there walked away with a different vision if they had a different one before on what is a Jew and on um, how people are supposed to behave. Yes, you are right. That is an amazing example. Dina? Oh, sorry. Similar to Aliza, I went to the Siom Hashas a few years ago, and it was so incredible at MetLife Stadium to see. And there was this article in a New York newspaper, I forgot, an opinion piece by someone who worked there as a, sanit as a sanitation worker, someone who cleaned up the stadium. And it was the regular workers that work at the stadium who do all the events there. They're employed by the stadium. And he said that he'd never seen anything like it. He said that the, the differences between any other event and a Jewish event. And he said that like, normally he had a list of, I think, seven things that blew him away. And he said that they had a meeting afterward and they all like almost couldn't believe it. Like, was this staged? Was this some weird thing? He said that like, they have a box where they put, people can put like items that are found that are reported to be dangerous. And in any event, there's, you know, maybe 500 to a thousand things and there were zero. And he said that every single person said, thank you. And he said that at the end, the final thing was that non-Jews come together to celebrate other people, to celebrate a distraction, a sports game, a concert, someone they can idolize and Jews come together to, to celebrate something they accomplished, something that's like a spiritual accomplishment. I thought that was so powerful. That is, that is, and it is very much in sync with what Aliza said. And I think Aliza posted this week about some, also some security person at the Zaka event and yeah, I think it's it is which which I think expresses like going back to what Miriam was saying that we don't necessarily have to be conscious that we're instructing. Hopefully, how we live should be instructing, and if we're doing something in the eyes of other people, that should be instruction. Hopefully, it should be good instruction. But you're right, Dean. That's exactly the same idea, and it's very powerful because we don't we sort of take these things for granted. Very powerful, Eliza. Something else. So I also wanted to share on a totally different note, when um, we recently had elections. And so I, I went for early voting. And when I went for early voting, I asked one of, and I, I looked around, I saw almost all from people there. I asked one of the people when I came up to the table to give my address and you know find out which table they wanted me to go to, and I asked, I said, tell me, how's the turnout going so far? And she looked at me and said, it's one of the lowest turnouts historically that we've ever had, which I found out later, it really was the lowest turnout historically. And I said, so who's coming? And she said, everyone who comes is dressed like you or would be a man dressed like your father, your husband would probably be dressed. Now, she didn't know who my husband was, didn't know who my father, but basically she was saying from people, which was a statement, we are coming out to vote. We are doing our civic duty. And I, I thanked her for being right. that, That's well, other, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's that's in that in that context, that was definitely a Kiddush Hashem. That definitely was a statement of, like you're saying, morality, civil duty. Yes. And then we could take it a step further and think of opportunities where we directly can share with people, where we directly can be that little Yaakov. Again, not like, oh, we're the instructor here, but understanding we are, as the nations quote what it says, right? We're the light to the nations, which means we have an ability and we have a responsibility. And I think now when we look at the world, it's really, it's really very obvious both. It's very obvious both, meaning when we see so many people that are coming so strongly pro-Israel, pro-Jews, there's a reason why they're doing that for most of them. They've been impressed, they've seen, they've heard, they've understood, they've been impressed. And they realize like, this is where it's at. This is the truth, or for many Christians, many fundamentalist Christians, this is God's chosen people. And for the people that are 
in the other direction, unfortunately, and of course, there's a lot of them also. It's like, why are they behaving that way? Probably many of them don't know any Jews in the world. <laughs> Again, it depends where they live. But for some of these places, it's like, what Jews do they know to have such hatred towards Jews? Every time. Like we're saying, we have an ability, we have responsibility, we can impact. And what you can be sure of is whatever you do in front of the eyes of the world, they'll always process it as a Jew. So whatever you do right and whatever you do otherwise, it will be that's what Jews do. If you're kind and gracious, the people around you will know Jews are kind, gracious people. If you're rude and arrogant, the people around you will know Jews are rude and arrogant. And if you take an interest and you try to help and you try to lift them up and give them a better way of doing things, they'll know that as well. Dina, were you going to add something? I was just thinking that like I'm in a university setting and although they're pretty friendly to Jews, a lot of them, a lot of the people in my cohort have not really had any interactions with, they don't know any Jews. They're pretty neutral, but they don't know anyone. And it's a lot of like, I feel the- in, The weight. I, yeah, I feel the weight exactly of like everything I do, especially during this like intense time is I'm the like Jew that they know. And it's like this intense, like weight of like everything, the way I speak to professors, the way I speak to the security guards, I feel the eyes on me being the like resident Jew and the one that people go to with questions or whatever statements, opinions. And it's, it's, I feel it. And I can only imagine like on a regular day carrying that. Yeah. And it's true. And, and, and it's true. And, you know, we believe, like we said, that Yaakov lifted up his feet. He was going on his shlichus. He was going on his mission. Every one of us is God's emissary. Every one of us. And God puts each of us exactly where we should be for today. It might change tomorrow, but for today, for his mission. And who sees you, who you see, who you interact with, who interacts with you, it's all scripted. It's all by God to use you, his emissary, to do his mission. There's about 15 million Jews and about 8 billion mankind. So each one of us, even if you think, eh, no, me, I don't know. I'm a housewife. I never see anyone anyway. I'm like, you know, in my little bubble, in my little religious enclave, we all interact. We all deliberately are around people that perhaps are absorbing from us a lot more than we realize. And it's, it's yeah, it is a responsibility. And you know, I, I definitely think about it and feel it. And even in the little things, like when I'm talking with someone using their name, being friendly, being warm, being gracious, I always have this overarching sense of I represent something. And I know when I use a person's name and I'm looking at them in the eye and I'm friendly and warm and gracious, they know they're processing. Jews are really nice people. Jews are respectful people. Jews are kind people. And again, that's giving them a moral message because Jews are the moral parameter of the world. Shira? Hi. Hi. So nice to you on. Hi. I know. Sorry, I'm late. Um, so We're happy last week I was Thanks. Last week I was shopping at the kosher supermarket and there was a, you know, uh, like a security guard watching. And I'm like, I got to get you some warm kosher food just to like, warm your heart before the Sabbath. And he's like, okay, thanks. I got him like kosher pizza and a bureka and my water. He was so thankful. And I just like, like what you're saying, like any chance you have to make the Jewish person look, you know, sweet, nice, kind, whatever. Like I'm, I like actually look for it. I go out looking for it and it's everywhere. It's at the gym, anywhere, anywhere I go. So yeah. Wow. So that, and that, that's a pretty impressive example. I don't know if many of us would take the time and run and buy it and run back and bring it. There's a lot of like time. No, he was, he's like, thank Friday. you so much. I was so hungry. This is my lunch. Now he was so appreciative and he sat there eating it. And I'm like, I'm like, I said, thank you for always, you know, for watching us and protecting us. And he was just like, it was such an easy Kiddush Hashem. It was just, I don't know. Beautiful. It was good. No, it's beautiful. It's it's beautiful. And you know, like, so she was saying, it's easy. I would feel like, oh my gosh, I don't have any time to do any of these great things she was doing. Oh. 
<laughs> but but she did it and she did it and maybe you know maybe you're not going to run to another store but maybe in that store it's a great built-in example what she was saying is she looks for those opportunities she doesn't wait for them to knock her over she looks for them because we every one of us i think of it sometimes like we're god's billboard you know billboards represent whatever they're selling every one of us is god's billboard actually there's a a story there was a follower a chassid of the first Rebbe, the first leader of Chabad, referred to as the Alta Rebbe. And this Chassid's name was Rav Shmuel Munkas, and he had a bit of a sense of humor, and sometimes he would try to teach deep messages in sort of light, humorous ways, which is the easiest way for people to swallow them. And one day he hung himself outside the Alta Rebbe's house. And people looked at him and said, Shmuel Munkas, what are you doing there? I'm hanging up here. Well, get down. What are you doing there? Why are you there? And he said, well, outside of Shoemaker, you see a pair of shoes. That's what he makes. Outside a tailor, you see a suit. That's what he makes. Well, a rebbe makes chachasit. So I'm outside his house. Meaning I'm on display. We're what's fashioned by God. We're what God makes. We're the Jews. We're his people. We represent him. Everyone that appreciates us, on some level is aware of that. Some people very obviously, like the fundamental Christians, and some people less obviously, but they get it. On some level, they get it. You know, when Mark Twain wrote that beautiful piece about the Jew, and I doubt Mark Twain had encountered too many Jews in his life either. But in his beautiful piece about the Jew, that I'm sure any of you can Google to read if you've forgotten it. He doesn't say God's chosen people, but he's like, there's something here. They have something. There's some mystery of their existence or something about them that's different than the rest of us and of course because we're different than the rest that's why anti-semitism is very easy as you know some people that are talking now non-jews looking at this issue and they're saying well of course jews are always going to be the target of, of anti-semitism they're always going to be the, the 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 target of aggression because wherever we are we're the minority and wherever we are we're so successful so that's a built-in recipe for for dislike that's a built-in recipe for certain types of people to, to hate us because they're jealous. Why are we so few? Why are we such a minority? And why are we so successful? And for other people, look at those exact same facts. We're such a minority and we're so successful. It's like, wow, there's something special about you people. What do you have? What's your beat? What's the pulse? And of course, our choice and job is to try to turn things around that it's that it's in the positive. Someone just sent me a, a text. Okay, so someone said the fact that we are willing to release 150 people that are for very good reason in prison, just rescue 50 people shows what we're like, as do many things, many things. And that's why I think people that have the eyes to see and not the hatred already implanted in their hearts do see. And they see more and more and more and more. I mean, like, I saw something a previous prime minister of Canada came out with a little video on why he supports the Jews, why he supported the Jews when he was, a, I guess, I think it's prime minister. And, 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 and yeah, so this is, this is, I don't know if he's considered a Jew lover, but he just went through the facts. And we look at the facts. It's like, it is so obvious. So why doesn't the whole world see those facts? For some blinded by hatred, for some, you're always looking for the easy target. For some, it's just not very smart and just going with the mob. Safety in numbers. If this is what people are, if, why do people join the Nazi party? For some, to take advantage of the situation. For some, hatred. And for some, just going with the wave. Just doing what everyone else does. Eliza? So going back to looking at Yaakov as a model for us. So Yaakov sought out and dealt with Lavan, the trickster. How do we, I, I guess, here we are, we're dealing with America, where in terms of these deals over arms, we're dealing with the Arabs, Hamas, over deals with getting our people. What are we supposed to take from Yaakov? Not that any of us are telling or would be listened to by the government in Israel, but what are we supposed to take from Yaakov's interactions and how we're supposed to then see these interactions? I think that's a great point. What we see from Yaakov was that total 
dedication to God that saved him when he should have been down under again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And if you if you study the Torah portion, it like makes no sense. Yaakov should have left in rags, in tatters, if he survived at all, with absolutely nothing. And he leaves Lovin after those 20 years with enormous wealth. How? Because he's stuck with God. Only because he's stuck with God. It's not that he was a better trickster than Lovin. He wasn't. Yaakov ishtam yoshev ahalim. Yaakov was pure. That's how the Torah is describing him. Ishtam, a man of purity who sits in the tents, the tents of Torah. And Yaakov in the tents of Torah manages to succeed over this ultimately deceitful person, so shrewd, so conniving with plot after plot after plot after plot at the end after he spends you know, he spent seven years working for Rachel, and then he spends another seven years working for Rachel, and then he's ready to go, and then he stays and actually Kabbalistically did enormous spiritual work. Obviously, he wasn't wasting his time there just to crew some whatever. But he says, love and change the deal on him a hundred times. He writes this. This is written explicitly in the verses. The only reason I'm walking away with anything is because God protects. What did Yaakov do for God to protect him? Yaakov was a servant of God. Yaakov was immersed in Torah. Yaakov was immersed in, in being absolutely honest as Lavan, who's so shrewd and deceitful and therefore abused everyone else, else as shrewd and deceitful. He trusted Yaakov to give him another seven years honest work because he saw how he was for the first seven years. For 14 years, he didn't sleep because he's learning Torah day and night. For 20 years, he doesn't sleep because he's watching these sheep day and night. So Following Yaakov's example, and I think what Aliyah is saying is a very powerful point, how do we overcome a world of people of such evil? Only by God. As some other, you know, whatever, I don't know, okay, philosopher, you know, some non-Jew said a few years ago, the Jews are the only people for these thousands of years, 3,000 some years, same name, same language. Same religion, same land. We're the only ones of all of mankind, which means we're the only nation, race, religion, culture that has survived 3,000 years. Why? We're the minority. And we're not only the minority. We're the abused, victimized, target of such wrath minority. And we always emerge on top because of God. So now when we look at the stakes, I mean, everyone can have different feelings. But when I look at this idea of they're giving a four-day ceasefire, I'm like, on the physical level, terrified. And then I tell myself, there's a God. And then I say to God, you have to protect every soldier. Every soldier, I don't know what they're going to be doing for the next four days, but not fear that not another extra soldier should die because of this four-day ceasefire. Not fear that any extra person should be harmed because of this four-day ceasefire. Is that humanly possible? It's godly possible. When we look at America, right? We said we had in Tebby, America had months to try to simulate the same thing and failed miserably after us. We got the Jews out of Entebbe. They couldn't get the American hostages out of Iran. So now it's the opposite because America already showed us that the type of war we're trying to win is impossible. It's impossible. America tried it in Iraq impossible dismal failure america tried it in afghanistan impossible you cannot win terrorist guerrilla urban warfare you can't do it you can't win a war where your enemy slips off the 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 the, the, the mask and suddenly he's a civilian when he could go into any house and be warmly embraced by all the people there and just melt into it you can't win such a war let alone with 500 kilometers of tunnels. They couldn't do it. We can. Why can we? Just like Yaakov. How did Yaakov win over these impossible situations? Because he stuck with God. Not because he was shrewder. He was not shrewder. Ishtam. He was pure and simple. Ishtam. He was simple. He wasn't shrewd at all. He wasn't conniving at all. 
So how did he succeed? Because he stuck with God. Because he stuck with God in his moralities and virtues, as in his honesty. Stuck with God in total commitment to Torah and all of the commandments. And therefore, God protected him. So when we're dealing with all these forces in the world, and, and sometimes it's terrifying, it's really not worthwhile. There's nothing in the news worth listening to and reading anyway, because I know, I don't know if you else are still into it. I reached this point where it's like, I'm not going to read anything that's going to give me anything. You know, everything says the same thing. Everything says nothing. Nothing I know is true anyway. And it's it's all sad stories. But when I when I hear and think, I'm like, no, no. We're not like the rest of the world. The same way we're the only nation that still exists with the same land and the same language and the same religion. The same way, no matter how on the physical plane this should play out, the physical plane has nothing to do with us. When Yaakov, we were discussing last week, got dressed in Esau's clothing and he was deceiving the most pure, 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 honest person was wearing deception. That's symbolic in a sense of every Jew. Because every Jew wears Aesop's clothing. Every Jew acts like, man, I'm a ghost to you. I'm normal. I could talk about all the same things you can talk about. I know all the stuff you know. Where You're wearing Aesop's clothing. You're a deceiver. Using Elisa's words, you're a trickster. No. You, you're a piece of God. You're above all this. You're a stranger in a strange land. You're an alien. You're a Jew. You're a piece of God. And you wear a piece of clothing. And maybe the disguise works well and you really look like the world and you look so much like the world and the disguise works so well, you've fooled yourself as well. And maybe the disguise is a little thin because it's just too obvious that you're beyond the world completely. But we always have to know, no, we're, we're, we're the tricksters. We're an ace of clothing. We are not ruled by the laws of nature according to the laws of nature none of us should be here every one of us i don't care if you come from iraq or from russia every one of us is descendant of martyrs and miracles there shouldn't be 15 million jews in the world today maybe there'd be a few hundred like there's a few hundred sumerians in israel you know an ancient race a relic of an ancient race like there's the relics in Greece and the relics in Rome. There should be the relics in Jerusalem. We're alive and we're vibrant and we're 15 million strong because we're not like the world at all. So I think, Elisa, strong answer to an innocuous question, but I think it's a very powerful point that you're raising. We look at the Parsha and Yaakov overcame it all by purity and a total commitment to God. And we will overcome this with the same. And we're waiting.